be seated. <clears throat> Open up your Bibles to Habakkuk. That's found in the table of contents in the front. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. I uh, haven't heard anybody start singing the song yet. There's the last one. There you go. <laughs> Habakkuk, and we'll be in, in chapter 1 here in just a moment. We sing that chorus fairly regularly. That's one of the ones that we sing a lot on Sunday evenings. God can do anything but fail. And there are a lot of questions. I have worked with teenagers a good bit. And occasionally you get a smart aleck teenager will walk up to you, and they've got a question for you. And it's something of the... Something of the nature of, well, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? Or can God make a circle square? Or something of that nature. And uh, obviously, those questions are self-defeating, aren't they? They're, those questions, it's not a matter of power. It's not, uh, you, you could ask, well, can, if you had enough dynamite, could you make a square circle? No, no, it's not, that's not the, it's not an equivalent uh, question. It self-destructs. So uh, if you, if you, push back a little bit on that if you ever have somebody ask you. We know, of course, that God is omnipotent. Omni, meaning all. Potent, meaning power. God is all-powerful. He has all of the power that there is. God can do anything. God can speak worlds into existence. The Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he can move it whithersoever he wills, like the river of water. Uh, we know that God is able to do anything but the psalm says god is able to do anything but fail but did you know that there are four different places in the bible specifically that we're going to look at tonight where we're told four specific things that god cannot do none of them is as simple as god can do anything but fail i'll make the point at the end all of these things if god could do these things which the bible says he can't it would be a failure so it's, the song is true, but it's a little bit more, more complicated than that. So number one, you come here to Habakkuk chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 13. And it says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. So real quick, what is the, what is the thing that God cannot do according to Habakkuk 1, 13? Can't look on sin. Can't look on iniquity. It says, Wherefore lookest thou on them that deal treacherously, and, behold, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he? Now, we could go into to detail on Habakkuk, and maybe someday we will. I, I am planning on sometime doing a study through Habakkuk. It's a tremendous uh, study and probably the most applicable of the minor prophets to the day in which we live, specifically in what we're seeing going on. But Habakkuk is writing about the impending judgment that is going to be coming upon the people of Judah. What kingdom came and took over Judah? Do you remember? The Babylonians. The Babylonians. The Babylonians came. The Assyrians took Israel. Babylon came and took Judah. And the, the, the writings of Habakkuk are actually three chapters of his struggle, basically with the question, how can a just and a holy God use such a wicked people as the Babylonians to bring about his will. That's basically what Habakkuk is. It's him saying, Lord, really? The Babylonians, you're going to use? The Babylonians are terrible. And they were. I mean, I, I have, have made this statement before. I couldn't stand before you in mixed company and read the, the accounts of what the Babylonians did to their prisoners. I mean, it's brutal what they did. They were terrible, bloodthirsty, awful people. And, and God tells Habakkuk, those are going to be the people who I'm going to use to judge Judah. And Habakkuk says, Lord, the Babylonians, they're terrible. Surely, surely you're not going to use them. So if God can't look at evil, the question would come to us, how can he see mankind at all? How can God look, how can God look at, at anybody? If, if God can't look at evil, then that means that he must never look at earth because earth is, a, is an evil place. In Habakkuk's case, Lord, how can you look on the Babylonians? They're so bad. Now, Judah was bad too, but he says, Lord, they're so much worse. 
How, how can you use that, that, that more wicked people to judge your own wicked people? Well, there, the answer to if God can't look at evil, how can he look at mankind at all, uh, does fall down to the definition of the words in this verse. The first word, when it says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. That word, to behold, means to gaze upon. It means to re respect. It has the idea of to look at and enjoy. God is of purer eyes to enjoy watching wickedness. The Bible says in Psalm 101, 3, I, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. That is man imitating God. God is of purer eyes than to look at and enjoy wickedness. The second word there, he says, and canst not look on iniquity. Different Hebrew word meaning to regard with pleasure, with favor. God cannot regard with care the to, to look on iniquity. C can man look on wickedness <coughs> with pleasure? <laughs> yes, hence Hollywood, right? Man can look on wickedness and enjoy it. God cannot. God does not look on the wickedness of, of anyone with pleasure, with care, with respect, with enjoyment. God can't look with pleasure at that which is unholy. In the case of the Babylonians, in the context here of Habakkuk 1, God was not looking favorably upon the wicked Babylonians. He was looking at them as a tool to accomplish his will. He was going to use them... What was God's purpose in using the Babylonians? Well, he was, he was judging his people with a people more wicked than they were. But eventually, the Babylonians would also face God's judgment. And as we have it recorded for us in Daniel chapter 5, it was on the night of Belshazzar's feast when the Babylonian Empire was taken by another empire. The Medo-Persian Empire came in, and Babylon, the great city, fell in one night. And so God used an evil people. It wasn't that he was looking on them with pleasure. It was that he was looking on them as a tool to be used to correct his people. And then God used another people group to correct that people group. Because if God didn't use imperfect people, who would he use? He wouldn't use anyone. God uses men. God uses wicked men, but God does not look on their wickedness. God doesn't look on their sin with pleasure. So what does this mean for me? Because uh, I, I've sinned. And so have you. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, this, this verse, maybe right in, the, right in the margin of your Bible, if you do such things, write Philippians 3, 9. Because while God cannot look at sin, God does look at me, and God does look at me with pleasure. God looks at me, according to Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. What, what is another thing? What, what is our righteousness like? In scripture, filthy rags. filthy rags. So I'm not found in my own righteousness, which look like filthy rags, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. When God looks at me, he doesn't look at me in my sin. What does he look at me in? He looks at me, according to Philippians 3 9, in the righteousness of his son. Because of salvation, because I have been justified. And then through the process of sanctification, I am made more into the image of his son. That's the, that is the glory of this, this whole principle, that God is of purer eyes than to behold evil. God doesn't enjoy looking on iniquity. God can use those who are wrong. God can use those who are in sin, as he did with the Babylonians, as he has countless times. But... God is, when he looks at me, I'm not found in my own iniquity. I'm found, rather, in the righteousness of Christ. So how does he look at unsaved, look at unsaved people when they don't have Christ? Well, he looks at them in, in this life. He looks at them. The Bible says that God is angry with the, with the wicked every day. 
God will look at them and God will, God will, will, will punish them. And one day, if they're found before him without the righteousness of Christ, he will cast them out of his sight forever into, into hell. But it would be that God, God does not look. It's when we think God cannot look on iniquity, it's not, oh, I can't believe I saw it. It's God does not gaze on it fondly. God does not look on it with respect. God doesn't look on it with pleasure. He can, he does look at the lost. How do we know that? I mean, how, is that just somebody's opinion or theory? Or, I mean, how do we know that? that? To say, to know what precisely? That God can't look at the. He just doesn't look on a farm. That's what the word means. When it says that he doesn't behold evil. It means to look on it fondly. That's the, the, the word means. The Hebrew word that when it says to behold, thou art of purer eyes than to behold means to gaze upon. So when you gaze upon, have you, we all know what it is to look and see something that you don't want to see. But you also know what it is to gaze on something. When you look at it and you just you turn your head, <laughs> this happens when when some when you're in public with your children and you see some you see somebody doing something that they ought not be doing and your kids that they turn and all attention and they're just you know, got their and you, you grab their eyes and you try to try to avert them but that's how kids are gazing on what they ought not. God does not look on evil with pleasure; He looks upon it with dis displeasure. There is a there's an anger that God ex expresses so with that which is God evil. God can't look on sin or evil. He does. But just not. God, when we say that God can't look, God does not have eyes like we do. Yeah. So it's it's a different a different a different meaning of the word. Did, did Jesus look at sinful people when he was here on earth? Yes. Absolutely. Everybody who he came in contact with, including his parents. Everybody. So it's not that God with his eyes does not look, because God is a spirit. But God is able to, when, when God looks on sin, speaking, speaking metaphorically, because God doesn't have eyes, but when God looks on sin, he does so with dis displeasure. When God was on, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken, forsaken me? Why did God forsake him? Well, God was there. God is everywhere. But it was that God was turning his, the eyes of God that had always looked with joy and, and pleasure on his son had been averted. And now the wrath of God was being poured out on his son on the cross. I would have thought it was always through the son and the Holy Spirit. You know, instead of just looking on it, being able to look on it, just was not pleasure. Yeah, it, the idea would, would be that God is not God, again, God's a spirit, but God is not able to deal with sin that is outside of his son in, in, a, good, in a good way. How is God going to deal with the sin of men permanently? He's going to cast judgment. them into hell. Judgment. Right, judgment. And that's, that's what it means, that God is a pure eyes. God can't look on iniquity. That's what it means, that God cannot look upon it favorably. It's always going to merit his, his judgment. Another, another word that may, may actually give a little bit more light, we read Psalm 66, verse 18. We talked about this in Sunday school a few weeks back. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The idea, the, the word regard in Psalm 66, 18 is the same word as behold in Habakkuk 1, 13. So you could say, accurately translated, that thou art of purer eyes than to regard evil. God does not regard that which is evil. My fellowship with God is broken because he can't look favorably upon sin. When I am giving sin a place of honor in my heart, it's going to create distance between me and God. God, he won't regard, he won't regard me if I am regarding sin in my heart. Relationship wise. Relationship, yes. So number one, he cannot look on sin. Number two, flip over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 2.
2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 11. It says, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So, number one, God cannot look on sin favorably. Number two, what does it mean? What, what do we find out from 2 Timothy 2, verse 13, that he cannot do? Deny himself. Can't deny himself. Can't deny himself. Some believe that verses 11 through 13, what we just read, were actually a, a hymn of the early church. And if you look at it, it does kind of have that type of a meter, how, how it kind of flows where uh, if we be dead with him, we'll also live with him. If we suffer, we'll also reign with him. It kind of has that sing-songy type of an, of an aspect to it. Let's break it down just a little bit. If we be dead with him, what, what is it talking about? The crucifixion of sin. The crucifixion of sin. As the song says, to be dead to the world. Yeah, to be dead to the world. Yeah. That would be dead with Christ also. Yeah. Romans 6, verse 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. The, the being placed into his death. So if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. So what does it mean for us to be alive with Christ or alive unto Christ? Well, uh, the Galatians 2.20 that we've talked about, it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. Romans 6 verse 4 says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So, if we be dead with him, if we died with Christ, did, did we die with Christ? The Bible says so. The Bible says there's an equivalency. When Jesus died, when I accept him as my personal Savior, I died too. And, and then, in that he rose, I, I rose with him. And so, Christ who died and is now alive, I died with him and I now live with him. It says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 says, I have fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Does God reward those who suffer for his sake? Absolutely he does. We, we could go, and, and we did, when we did our series on end times prophecy, we went and gave many of the scriptures that tell that during the millennial reign that we, we will have a, 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 an authority position in, in the millennial reign of Christ when he rules and reigns from Jerusalem. So if, if we're dead with him, we'll, we'll rise with him. If we suffer, we'll reign with him. It says if we deny him, he'll also deny us. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Just like single, you, you deny Christ and it's all over? No. no. Can you think of an example that would, that would give the life? Yeah, Peter. Peter did it not once, not twice, but three different times that he denied Christ. And yet we know that Peter is, is in heaven because Jesus said that, uh, that he would be the, kind of a, a keystone in the formation of the church. So it's, it's not a single act of faithlessness, but this is talking about final rejection. If, if one dies never having believed in Christ, having denied, no, I don't need a Savior, that one will be denied as a child of God. They say, I don't need God. And then one day they get to heaven and they say, oh, but, but Lord, I, 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 I knew. And, and what does the Bible say? Or he'll say, depart from me into, into everlasting fire. Verse 13 of 2 Timothy 2 kind of further emphasizes the point, which is where we get our thing that God cannot do. It says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. 
he cannot deny himself. How is how is man saved? Faith. By grace, through faith, in Christ. What else? What, what else plus that? Nothing. 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 Okay. So, what would happen if God allowed a couple of men into heaven because they had real good intentions? He, he, he can't. And, and the reason why, he cannot deny himself. That's what this verse is talking about. God can't deny who he is. For, for God to, to say, it's by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Titus 3, all of these passages. And then he says over here, and, and if you have real good intentions. That would be him denying himself. That would be him saying, actually, I didn't mean it. And, and God cannot do that. That would be, as the song that we just sang, that would be for him to fail. That would be for God to say, well, <laughs> no, not really. Which would lead us to ask the question, well, what else What else did you say that wasn't true? And, and we would be right to do so if he could deny himself. But he can't. God doesn't deny himself. To make loopholes would be to deny himself, and God cannot make allowances for those who reject it. Believer's Bible Commentary says of this particular phrase here, it says, If men are unbelieving, he must be faithful to his own character and must treat them accordingly. He is just as faithful in his threatenings as in his promise. When God says, Those who come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. We can take that as an absolute promise of God, can't we? Aren't you glad? But when God says that those who don't come to me by faith, I'll cast out. That, that is also a promise. Or you could say that's a threat. Or you, you could say, is that a threat? Yep. If you don't come to God by faith, you'll be cast out for all eternity. And he can't deny himself and, and make a loophole. Yes, sir. Well, I, hear, I took that verse to mean that <clears throat> when he said he invited faithful. He doesn't give up on us until we take our last breath and reject him. He abides to the sinner even. He'll still faithful and and uh, remains true to his word. He hardens hearts. But well, that he hardens hearts. Well, if you look at the first part, it that that's not the first phrase of the verse if you look at right. the, if you look at 213 it says if we believe not so who is this talking to unbelievers. this would be talking to unbelievers by, by the very definition this would be those who die in a state of unbelief yes just as when it says you know, whoso should deny me before men is talking about not those who say you know like peter did i don't know the man that's that's not because peter is saying okay but this is talking about an unbeliever who dies in unbelief. It says, he abides faithful to his word. And God said that he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So that's his word. He abides faithful both ways. His promise that he that hath the Son hath life. But the, the if you want to call it the threat side of that, he that hath not the Son hath not life. Both sides of that are, are accurate. And he can't deny himself. He can't. You could say it this way. He's not going to break his word. God can't break his word. He can't break a promise, which we'll see is actually the third thing that we have for us here. Flip to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. Any other questions on what we were saying about he, he cannot deny himself? Does that make, make sense? Understandable? Yes, sir. So that's, when they talk about, the question always comes up, can God change his mind? That would be denying himself. Yeah, when it, like we've talked about this a little bit in, in, in 1 Samuel, it says God repented. Mm -hmm. The idea is that God never asks for a mulligan. God never says, oh, I wish I could do that. If I could do that over again, I'd do it. You know, God never has a change of mind. God never has a change of heart because if if you can change something that is absolutely perfect, what does that mean? It's not perfect. It wasn't perfect. So God is perfect, mm -hmm. therefore he cannot change. So for God to change his mind, 
can't happen. That's what I'm saying. That, yeah. That goes. That kind of goes back to he can't deny himself. Yeah. Yeah. So he can't. That God. God is perfect. He's already laid down. You could say it this way. He's laid down the ground rule, ground rules for salvation, and they don't change for anybody. You deny Christ. The Bible says in another portion of Scripture in Hebrews that there's no further sacrifice. You, you, he's not. He can't give another son. He only had one. He made. He made the way. If you reject that, that would be the unpardonable sin, right? To die in a state of rejection is to say, I don't need God. And thus, God cannot deny himself. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, I need you to promise me something. Hold tight, because I'm not going to preach all of Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 is, is kind of deep. But, but walk with me through this, and if you have a question, stop me. Because the, the, the point of Hebrews 6 brings us to uh, our, our third thing that God cannot do. Hebrews 6 details the promises that are given to believers from God himself. And he's going to give an, an, an illustration of promises given, promises kept. Hebrews 6.13 deals with the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is given in Genesis, and it makes up three portions. Remember, a land, the land of Israel, a seed, the seed was specifically the children of Abraham, the children of Abraham through Isaac. Isaac, right? And then the blessing that would come through Isaac would be salvation, salvation through the Messiah. So a land, a seed, and a blessing. Hebrews 6, 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying... Surely, this is God speaking, surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, this is Abraham, he obtained the promise. So, when God gave the Abrahamic covenant, he gave his word. He gave a promise. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a land, a seed, and a blessing. And then, according to this verse, verse 13, he swore an oath. And because God doesn't have anything greater to swear by, he swore by himself. He said, by myself, I will give you a land, a seed, and a blessing. Now, would God's promise have been sufficient? Absolutely. He's God. But to, to just kind of pound it home, he gave a promise, and then he swore an oath by himself. When somebody swears to God, that is, that is their attempt for you to take what is about to come out of their mouth as seriously as at all possible. He swore an oath by himself that he would keep his word to Abraham. Look at verse 16 here in Hebrews 6. It says, for men verily swear by the greater. Okay? We, we don't. <laughs> for you to swear by yourself, will they take you seriously? <laughs> Probably not, right? That's not how it works, okay? They swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. When you stand up in court, they say, place your, place your hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, and say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. God. Why? Because we swear by that which is greater, okay? For you to say, I swear by myself. What would they say? You don't get it. Okay? No. You swear by that which is greater. Okay? No, nobody's people, maybe you've heard, uh, the, 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 the phrases have changed over the years, but have you ever heard somebody say, I swear on my mom's grave or my grandmother's grave or something? For, for you to swear on your dog, <coughs> you, you would think, they might, be, they might be trying to sell me something. If they're, not, if they're going to swear on something and they swear by something lower than themselves, you'd say, eh, they're not taking this seriously. God gave a promise. We can take God's promises at face value, but to prove his point, he swore an oath by himself. Take a look. Uh, well, with God, a promise made is a promise kept, but look at verse 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise... The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, meaning he wanted to make it, he, he's making a point. The immutability of his counsel means the unchanging nature of what he says. 
God is trying to make it, make it abundantly clear. And just as God promised Abraham a land, a seed, and a blessing, God has promised eternal life and blessing to those who come to him by faith. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got it on God's word. I could take you to verses that say that he that hath the Son hath life. I could take you to verses that say that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You could take me there too. And he swore by himself, just as with the Abrahamic covenant, that he would fulfill his promise to us. How seriously does God take the Abrahamic covenant? Looking at history, right? You, I, could, I could show you nations that used to exist that don't exist anymore. And the, the main reason... They picked on Israel, and God snuffed them out. They don't exist. You can't find some of those people groups. They're all dead because God killed them. Okay? God takes the Abrahamic covenant very, very seriously. How seriously does God take the covenant that he made with you and me, the covenant of salvation? Oh, so seriously. He, he made a promise, and he swore the same oath that he swore to Abraham. Now we come to our, our verse here. Look at verse 18. That by two immutable things, the promise and the oath, those are the two immutable. Immutable means unchanging. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, there's our third thing, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. I can have absolute, unshakable confidence in the promise of God when it comes to my salvation. You can have assurance because God, he made a promise. He made an oath, the same oath he swore by himself because there is none greater. God has made this. So he, he made the, the double promise to make a point. We have God prom God's promise that he'll keep He'll keep all that he's told us. All the promises in God's word are true. And it's impossible for God. Number three, what's our third thing that's impossible for him to do? Lie. He can't, he can't lie. He doesn't break promises. As I was thinking on this, I thought of FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It insur insures bank deposits up to a set dollar amount. And the promise is just as good as the government's word. They, they promise. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Can the government lie? Oh, yeah. Can the government tell the truth? Might be the, <laughs> might be the better question. Right? We have the government's word that if you put so much money in, they'll back you up. <clears throat> and, and it's not worth anything. We have God's word that everything that he said will come to pass. There are lots of fulfilled prophecies in God's word. Right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of unfulfilled prophecies in God's word. There are a lot of promises to believers. Will they come true? He, he swore they would. He, he said, this is going to happen, I promise you. I swear by myself that this will happen. And he can't lie. God promises us countless things in Scripture. All of them are as certain to take place as if they already had. And the reason for this, it's impossible for him to lie. So, that's number three. Number four, quickly. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. The very next book, if you're in Hebrews. James chapter 1. Another God cannot hear. It says, let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. So what's our fourth God can't? Can't be tempted, can't be tempted with evil. Why can't God be tempted with evil? Because he's perfection. Because he's, 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 he's perfection. <laughs> Leviticus 19, verse 2 says, I, the Lord your God, am holy. Isaiah 6, 3, this is the angels in heaven. And one said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 1 Peter 1, 16 says, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Why can't God be tempted with, with sin? Because he's sinless. He's, Holy. He's completely and totally set apart. He's, he's spotless. He's pure. He's, he's everything that evil is not. 
Because he's holy, he can't be tempted by evil. Look at the next verse here in James. Here's the contrast. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But, verse 14, every man or woman, this is for all of us, every man and mankind is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Why, why can't God be tempted? Well, God doesn't have lusts. Okay, He's perfect. He is complete. He's whole. God doesn't have lust for anything. Okay, So, he, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So God is totally pure. God is without fleshly lusts. To, to use God and lust in the same sentence, it sounds strange. Even as Christians, we deal with the presence of indwelling sin, don't we? We've talked about this in Sunday school. We have indwelling We have. Do you have a pull to, to the right? <laughs> a pull towards sin? Yep, we all do. The, the, the song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. But God doesn't have that. God, God doesn't have to stay on the straight and narrow. He is the straight and narrow. He, he doesn't have a draw. We do. We have a, a tendency. We have a pull. James draws a conclusion from this truth. He, he gives us the conclusion before he gives us the, the, the problem. He says in verse 13 that no man can say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God is not ever the source of temptation. By temptation, I mean solicitation to do evil. God never sets you up to do that which is wrong, to, to, to make you do wrong. That's not how God works. That's not what God does. The difficulties and trials that God allows into your life should be viewed not as an opportunity to sin, but rather as an opportunity to see the power of God live through you. The, the verse that we had as a memory verse, that, that when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul had the thorn in the flesh that was the messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he be exalted above measure. It was, it was something. He says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. weakness. So when the temptations, the trials, the, 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 the issues that come into our lives, when they come and they will come, then that's not that God is tempting us to sin. It's God allows things into our life with perfect forethought, with perfect knowledge of what we can handle, because he says in 1 Corinthians that he won't suffer us to be tempted above that we're able. When it says that he won't suffer us to be tempted, that means that he won't allow us to be tempted. Somebody said that, that uh, Satan will make it as hot as he can, but God's got his hand on the thermostat. God's not going to allow Temptation above that we're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear. So four things tonight that God can't do. Number one, God can't look on iniquity. And so he made a way for us to be robed in the righteousness of Christ. I can stand before God. God can look at me, not because I'm good, but because I'm in Christ. The Bible says in Jude 24 that one day he's going to present me before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. My joy and his joy. Okay, He can't look on sin, so God made a way that we could be robed in the righteousness of Christ. He can't deny himself. His salvation is only available to those who will accept his free gift by faith alone. He can't make a loophole. God's not, God is not able to go against himself. He's not going to go against his word. He can't lie. All the promises that he made will most certainly come to pass. He promised, and he swore an oath. Again, just the promise would have been sufficient. He gave the oath to prove a point. He swore by himself. And then, fourthly, God cannot be tempted with evil. God's not the source of temptation in our lives. What he allows into our lives should be seen as an opportunity for victory and closer fellowship, not as an opportunity to fall. God doesn't, God doesn't put us in a position where we have to sin. We don't have to sin. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir. God can't be tempted, but um, he allowed his son to be tempted. 
Jesus have said <laughs> yeah. Jesus Jesus could not have sinned because Jesus is right. God so was Jesus tempted well the Bible says that he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin yeah. the, the difference is and, and the illustration I think is the best one that I've come across the, the fact that the wave doesn't move the lighthouse off the rock doesn't mean it's not a wave does it doesn't mean it's not powerful the fact that the waves of temptation crashed around Christ, there's no chance he's going to move. There's no chance of it. He's God. But that doesn't mean that the temptation wasn't real. Satan, Satan put everything he had on the table, and he failed because Jesus is God. And he, he can't sin because he's perfect. But the the uh, there's there's an awful lot there with a lot of we, we could go down deep that that is what theologians call the hypostatic union not hydrostatic that's with mowers hypostatic <laughs> is the idea of the 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 100 god and 100 man and joined in christ and uh we, we we might look at that sometime and go down a little bit deeper there's some interesting things there C could god have sinned no because no. he's god was he tempted yeah yeah is it a real temptation if he can't sin well that's that's where you, you start splitting some hairs. The temptations were real. He couldn't sin because he's God. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts? Good question. Uh, yes, sir. A few years ago, I remember they said that the Pope changed a, a portion of the Bible. You know what I'm going to say? Lead us not into temptation. The Pope changed it to um, don't let us be tempted. Oh, really? <laughs> so... Why in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus is praying that to God as, a, as, a, as an example of what like a structured prayer would look like, why does he say, lead us not into, into temptation? Because of it being the model prayer. It also says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Jesus, Jesus was, not a, was not a sinner. Jesus was, he was praying a prayer. He, he said, thus... So he, when, he, when he started into the model prayer, it was, so pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. If you look at the actual Lord's Prayer, which is found in John 17, I, I would, we, we may go into that sometime. That was where Jesus was praying. It wasn't him putting on a, a clinic, yeah. where the Lord's Prayer is more of a clinic of how to pray. Uh, can Jesus say things to the Father that I can't? Did, did Jesus need to pray in Jesus' name? No, he's Jesus. He can, he can pray in his own name, just like God can swear by himself. I can't pray in my own name. I have to pray in the name of Christ. So he was putting on a clinic, whereas if you read in his other recorded prayers, he doesn't include, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. But I, I guess the Pope's understanding was, why would, why would we be led into temptation by God? <coughs> change it. Yeah. Well, we we know according to James that God doesn't lead us into temptation, but God does God allow us in a place where temptation will happen? Yeah. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Who was in the wilderness? Satan. So God God led him in the person of the Holy Spirit, led him into a place where he would be tempted. Did God do the tempting? No, God allowed the tempting. Did God tempt Job? No, God allowed Satan to tempt Job. God, God always, God will allow us to go into a place where temptation will hit, yeah. but he won't suffer us to be tempted above that we're able. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's more like don't let us go into an area or a place where we will be tempted. Did, I, I think... When Jesus is saying it or when the Pope is saying it? No, when Jesus. Okay. When Jesus. <laughs> I, say, I, I, cannot, I don't care what the Pope is. I can't, I can't claim to speak for the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, when Jesus is saying it, the idea, to lead us not into temptation, Would is it possible that God would keep a temptation from me if I asked him to? Mm -hmm. No. Absolutely. So I, I think that would be the purpose. And I have, I have prayed such. <laughs> you, you ever been spiritually exhausted? And you say, Lord, 
Right now, it wouldn't take much to knock me over. Help, help me out. Lead, lead, lead me in a way so I can just walk close to you. Yeah. And I think yeah. God, yeah. I think God can do that. I know. Yeah, I, I, I doubt the Pope is like, yeah, <laughs> like dug into it very deeply. So. Well, if if there's one thing Catholics have going for them, it's taking verses out of context and running yeah. with them. So, yes, yes, sir. J so what does a court system do when they know they have an atheist coming in and he's got an oath? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, it would be and, interesting. And how many people go in there and really don't even think about what they're saying? Yeah. Well, anymore, I, I mean, anymore you can swear, you can be sworn in on a Quran, you can be sworn in on any number of things. So it's the, the meaning behind it has greatly decreased over the years. So, I mean, for, for the average person who throws God's name around as a filler word, probably doesn't mean anything. Did it mean anything to the people who started out saying that? Oh, yeah. Man, it meant a lot. For you to swear by God was a big deal. We've, we've, cheapened, we've cheapened the expression to the point where now it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Yeah. I don't know, when they have an atheist or a, yeah, yeah, have somebody who doesn't believe in God, or a Hindu, you know, they could they have millions of gods. So. Interesting thought. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? God doesn't change his mind, but something came to my mind when, when you, you talked about that. And I think that... Uh, I think that... If I remember right, it tells us in the scripture that, that God, I don't know how to say it, had some remorse about making man when he saw so much sin and how he went against him. I yeah, with, say, with, with Noah. Yeah. He said that it grieved, it grieved God that he had made man. Yes. It's also, we, we saw it more recently in 1 Samuel where it says that it, it grieved God or it repented God that he had made Saul king. The idea there, it, it hurts, it hurts God. God is, God, while he is a spirit, God is capable of emotion. And it, it grieves God when we mess up. When we, when we go against God, it's, it, it is a painful thing. But is it is it that if God had it to do over again, would he have made man? Yeah, absolutely he would have. It's interesting because when God, did God know how bad we'd get today? Sure. He said, as it was in the days of Noah. Noah, so it will be in the end when the Son of Man comes. Interesting that it grieved God enough to destroy man, it, it hurt God enough and yet he saved eight people to start it over again with the full knowledge that it's going to get that bad again before I come back. So it's not that God was looking, like I said, it's not God taking a mulligan where he says, ah, oh, I didn't mean to do this. It's, it's God no. saying, this, this grieves me. But, but the, the neat thing about that is that as much as it grieved God, how they were in the days of Noah, as much as it will grieve God in the, in the end times, what is it that makes it worth it? Why does God put up with us? Well, because, wh why did he send his son? To, to, save, to, to save us, to have eternal fellowship. Eternal fellowship. And that fellowship starts when we die? No, that no, fellowship no. starts now. Mm -hmm. Why does God keep us, why, does God, why is God willing to put up with all the heartbreak? Well, the reason why is because he really wants fellowship with us. That's how important it is to God. It, important enough for him to put up with all the nonsense is fellowship with you and me. That that should say something to us when when we're willing to kind of slough off fellowship with God. We ought to take it seriously. Don't 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 skip your time with God. He he he's given an awful lot from us. What's that? I didn't I didn't mean that he had changed his mind about making man, but but it did grieve him. Or else. And I think that's no different than us as parents sometimes. Yeah. 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 When you when you walk in, you tell your wife, have kids, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
I wouldn't give up my kids, but we all, we all know what we're talking about, right? Kids are the greatest thing in the world, except when they're not. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, think on these things. God cannot. He can do anything but fail, and the four ways that we have spelled out for us in Scripture that he could fail. He can't look on iniquity favorably. He can't deny himself. He can't lie, and he can't be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. Good things for us to think on and praise the Lord for. So.